We're not many, but people are excited to see one another. There's some uh, good energy in the auditorium. I like it, I like it. If you ever want to hear the energy in the auditorium, if you're, ever, if you're not feeling good and you tune in on Zoom, uh, in between morning Bible study and the, and the worship services, because the mics are still on, man, you could, you could hear the love in the building. Everybody's so excited to see each other, and you can really hear it. Gina, how are you? Let's open up to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. <clears throat> While you guys are turning to Acts chapter 11, uh, we need to remember uh, Linda uh, Yassin. She has a couple of uh, gallstones. Uh, so uh, she was asking for the prayers of the congregation. So let's remember you, uh, Linda in our prayers. Also, I did the call out earlier. Let's continue to remember Charles. Uh, I was texting back and forth with Angela a little bit, and, and he's really struggling uh, with his health. And so... Um, her, uh, her sister was coming in the town from South Carolina. Uh, so. Chuck got moved. Uh, did he finally get moved? Chuck okay, good. Oh, so I knew he was supposed to today, but I didn't know if it actually came yay, about. Yay. So Chuck's over in Taylor, uh, Taylor Beaumont now, praise God, because now Diane could actually get a good night's sleep in her bed uh, and go back and forth, at least because it's only you know two yes. minutes from her house. Yes. So praise God for that. Uh, let's continue to remember Sherry and, uh, and Betty, like we t talked about on the previous call out. Um, uh, Betty had good results uh, from the surgery, just waiting for the test results now, as far as like what the, uh, what do they call that, the lymph biopsies? Nodes, lymph nodes. Yeah, the biopsies. biopsies and stuff like that that they probably took to make sure they got all the cancer. Um, and then, go ahead, Pam. So is Taylor Beaumont on Telegraph, or is that the Telegraph. Oh, Telegraph and Taylor, yep. Where the old heritage yeah, everybody still uses the old names instead of the new names because people still tell me, uh, like, uh, what is it, South, uh, South Shore? And I'm like, you're talking about Trenton? Because they, they know it as, you know. Yeah, so Seaway and the South Shore. And so it just depends, you know, what age group you're in. It just depends on what the name of the hospital is. Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Does that mean that he can have visitors or not Yes. Yes, but I would probably call to see uh, what his... Uh, uh, physical therapy schedule is because right. um, if he's in therapy then you won't be able to see him obviously um, but yeah so we'll, we'll get more information as far as on that from Diane I know Robin Eisen works there yeah Robin works there and Christy works there so she's oh, going to be she popping in on him too? yep all right Acts chapter 11 oh I'm sorry I'm sorry I just want to say one thing uh, in the call out, it said that Fred doesn't need surgery. Fred absolutely still needs surgery. But oh. they've just sunk the cancer enough that now they hope to do the surgery. Oh, I must have misunderstood Ed then. I thought he said that he may not need the surgery. No, no, he has to have the surgery. Okay. To get rid of it. Fault, Your fault? I'm blaming Ed. He said it was his fault. <laughs> he never does anything. Bring him on. But either way, it's still good news. Yeah. It's oh. still good news. Yeah, yeah. fabulous. Uh, yep. Uh, I got a text from uh, Rhonda and Yolanda, and unfortunately, uh, Rhonda has been diagnosed yes. with having uh, E. coli. I thought it was Yolanda. Yolanda, I'm sorry. Yolanda, she was diagnosed with what? E. coli. E. coli? Yes. Okay. And so she's on uh, antibiotics. antibiotics. And they're hopeful that it'll Tuesday. clear out before her surgery. Before the surgery? Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's add Yolanda to the prayer list as well. And then uh, at the end of our class, we'll do a prayer for, for everybody as well. All right, Acts chapter 11. Good evening, everybody. Acts chapter 11. So you remember, uh, well, it's been, what, three Wednesdays ago now, uh, when we were just we just finished up Acts chapter 10, and I started talking about the, some background information for chapter 11. We didn't actually get started in it. And I used the example of, uh, you know, back in the early 90s, you guys remember Los Angeles? You remember the, the prejudice? You remember the riots, right? 5,200 buildings were burnt, and... Uh, uh, damage or completely destroyed up to a billion dollars in damage. Uh, you had what, uh, 17,000 people were arrested, uh, over 2,000 injured, over 50 dead when it was all said and done. And you think about what was the, what was the reasoning, what caused uh, all of that destruction, all that loss of life and all of that anger and animosity in the riots, it was, it was prejudice, right? It was uh, racism, prejudice, and so you think about that, and I want you to guys, and we always hear myself and others say, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, right? That's what Solomon says. Well, did they have prejudice and racism back in the first century, right? I mean, you think about the Jews, and you think about the, the Gentiles, right? 
Uh, was there prejudice? Was there you know, uh, racism? Absolutely. And so you think about just all that goes on around the world. Uh, you think about what's going on today. The first century was no different. Uh, the Jews often called the Gentiles dogs. I mean, doesn't anybody love, does, you know, people love being called dogs, right? No, of course not. And they had such a disdain for them that was built up over generations, right? It started out with, if you guys remember, the, the original command of God, thus saith the Lord, was uh, it was a command to not intermarry, right? And they took it and they just went a thousand yards, you know, further with, with all of the strictness of the man-made rules generation of, by generation of man-made oral traditions that eventually came to be known as the Mishnah, which was written uh, towards the end of the uh, intertestamental period. Uh, but those traditions that were passed down from generation to generation have been going on for a very long time. And so there was a gentleman named Alfred uh, e Edersheim. He described the extent of the inbred prejudice that the Jews had against the Gentiles as every Gentile child so soon as born, was to be regarded as unclean. <coughs> From the womb, they were to be considered as unclean. This is what the Mishnah says. The Mishnah goes so far as to forbid aid to even a Gentile mother in her hour of need. No nourishment for her babe in order to not bring another child of idolatry into the world. It was not safe to leave cattle in their charge, to allow their women to nurse infants, to allow their physical uh, physicians to attend the sick, or to even walk in their company. And they, they and theirs were defiled, their houses unclean, and containing idols or anything dedicated to them, they were wholly unclean. If a heathen were left alone in a room that he might even defile the wine, he might even defile the meats on the table, or the oil in the wheat that was in the storehouse. Milk, bread, and oil prepared by a heathen were unlawful. If a Jew weren't uh, present when they were prepared, they were considered uh, prohibited. Uh, the wine was wholly prohibited, and even the touch of a heathen would pollute the entire barrel. So this is coming from the Mishnah, right? And so you think about what the oral traditions were. Did you, do you see stuff like that even passed down? Uh, in our country from generations, you go back to the 40s and 50s, right? Did we not have separate drinking fountains and, and bathroom facilities and so many other things, right? And so there's lots of examples you could give. So nothing, nothing's new, right? There's nothing new under the sun. They've been dealing with these problems of prejudice around the world uh, since the beginning of time. And so as you look at Acts chapter 10 from a few weeks ago, we know that the story, it showed the story of Peter's visit to Cornelius, and it also tells, uh, Peter's giving the, he's telling the gospel, right? Because there was the call for Peter to come to Cornelius' house. He gets there and he asks him, hey, you know, what, you know, why'd you call for me? And he says, well, I was praying in the ninth hour. You guys remember, right, from a few weeks ago? Praying in the ninth hour and all of a sudden an angel appeared, right? He had a vision. An angel appeared to him and said to send for Simon, Peter. He's at the Tanner's house. And you know that he goes there. And for a Jew to go uh, to uh, a Gentile's house would, would have been just considered like blasphemy, if you will. Uh, I mean, it would, have, it would have basically, you would have been kicked out of Judaism. You'd probably been kicked out of the mosque. I mean, it was considered a crime. It was a, such a huge violation. And I say all that to, to kind of set the stage for chapter 11. Because if you have your Bibles open to chapter 11... Let's start to read this, and you're going to start to see the reaction and how quickly that reaction spread from what Peter had done just days, if not weeks, earlier. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now the apostles and the brethren who were, brought, uh, who, who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men, and you ate with them? Who here, asked Peter, when you look at these first three verses, who was asking Peter to give an account of the conversion of Cornelius and his household? The apostles and the, and the, and the people who were with them. The apostles and people who were with them, right? Other words, you could say, Judy? That's what I was going to say. Right? I have my hand. Or you, other way, you could say brethren, right? And so let's, let's make sure we raise our hands. Uh, but brethren, Christians, it wasn't, it wasn't the Jews who came, right, uh, the, the, the members of Judaism who were coming to, uh, to call them out, well, they weren't going to come, A, because, well, they were no longer members of Judaism. 
They were now members of Christianity. But the Jewish converts to Christianity had a big problem with this because they still wanted to be members of Judaism and still be members of Christianity. They wanted to practice Judaism, but be Christians. Yeah, they wanted to practice Judaism, but be Christians. That's like being a Christian and wanting to practice Islam. Right? doesn't really work necessarily the same. And so you look at all of the rules and, and the traditions. Uh, didn't even the Apostle Paul say if you're going to keep one, uh, one letter of the law, you have to keep the entirety of the law? And he says, why are we going to bind, why are we going to bound that on the Gentiles when we ourselves can't even keep the law? And so you see here uh, that these were Judaizers, if you will. I use the word Judaizers. What does that mean? Let's raise our hands. Judaizers. What is the definition, definition of a Judaizer? Somebody, anybody? It's Jim? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, that would just be the Jewish people who are trying to force the Gentile Christians to follow the yeah. Jewish people. So law. Jewish people who converted to Christianity, right, from Judaism, but who were still trying to get people, force people to then do things like circumcision, to follow the law, right? Follow certain aspects of the law. Uh, to, to, to include the various feasts and, and holy days uh, as part of their, uh, uh, their beliefs in Christianity. And so these were brethren uh, who were deeply committed to the law of Moses. And they had a hard time getting it out of their system. But isn't that the reason why even Peter, the apostle, had to have a vision, right, about the, the, the sheet that came down, right, in the last chapter, and all the four-footed animals and the creatures? That's the reason why Peter had to have that vision, because even Peter still thought of the Gentiles as unclean. Hold on one second. Judy? You know what? I, this is a, you just saying that just made me think of when Peter had that vision from our Heavenly Father, it was almost like Saul, you know, Christ appearing to Saul to convince him. Yep. to change his mind. And that vision that Peter had was to convince him to change his mind. Yeah. Yeah, God, absolutely. God had to work to change them yeah. both. Tom, were you going to say? Oh, I think you said. So the most serious thing uh, that Peter did, according to these brethren, was to eat with these Gentiles. Remember, this is this is a Jewish elder tradition, not a "thus saith the Lord" command. And so, perhaps one reason for the criticism would have been because of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin would be stirred up against them, and so maybe. You could say, well, I wonder if maybe some of these Jewish converts were worried about maybe the, the commotion that it could cause within the Jewish community from their own family members and friends who are still members of Judaism, uh, who still attend the synagogues, right? Uh, you could say maybe that's it, but at the end of the day, many of them were still uh, practicing Jews while they were trying to live out Christianity. So you get to verse 4 and following. Notice what it says and as we go through uh, 4 through about verse 12. But Peter began speaking, and he proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying in a trance, and I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it, and I was observing it, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, and the wild beasts, and the crawling creatures, and the birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said... No, by no means, Lord, for, I, no, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. You pause in verse 8, and what is Peter seeing there? Peter is still applying the, the, the technicalities of the law, the dietary restrictions, even though he's no longer under said law. So you see what he's doing there still, right? And so if he's doing that, what else is he still holding on to? In his mind, he's still holding on to the Gentiles are unworthy, they're unclean. Verse 9, it goes on to say, but a voice from heaven answered a second time, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and everything was drawn back into the sky. And behold, at that moment three men appeared at the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go uh, with them without misgivings, and these six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. Isn't it interesting how even though Peter was sent by the Holy Spirit, he still took six, six brethren with him. Why do you think he took six brethren with him? Let's raise our hands. <laughs> Go ahead. He wasn't sure. He wanted witnesses. Yeah. Even though the Spirit said, hey, don't have any misgivings, right? Basically meaning don't doubt. He still doubted, Tom. He had to bring it positive. He needed security. 
He, he wanted some security, right? He wanted some eyewitnesses. That's <laughs> like uh, uh, Dave wouldn't mess with, with, with me. It's Dave's fault. Yeah. Right. Did this. That's yeah, Dave's was, fault. He was looking for some uh, space to run. Yeah, exactly. So, so what did Peter say that the Spirit told him when the men came to the house there in verse, 12, uh, verse 11 and 12? He said that he was instructed by the Holy Spirit to go with these, to go with these men and make no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And so it was the Holy Spirit, God, who had given him instructions. And if people wanted to criticize him for going to, these, to this Gentile's house, who do they really have a problem with? God or the Holy Spirit. They got a problem with God, right? The Holy Spirit, who is, the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. The Son is God, right? And so if they got a problem, Peter said, hey, you may want to take that up with the Holy One. Go ahead. This is the important reason why Christ told them in John 14 and 16. Yeah. I will send the Spirit. Yeah. To show you all things mm -hmm. and to make things straight, yep. or to explain everything. Exactly. This is one of those occasions. This is one of those occasions. And remember, you guys have heard me say this uh, several times now as we've been going through Acts. Even the Holy Spirit, when they came upon them in Acts chapter two, in the uh, right on the day of Pentecost, right, and the church began, He didn't give them the complete, one hundred percent full revelation. No, He gave it to them still in pieces. Right? He was still bringing them along slowly. Why? Well, because he knows we're fallible men, and even though, yes, we're guided by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was still bringing them along slowly. You're, we're at this point in Acts chapter 10 or 11, you're 10 years. 10 years, and there's still, think about it, Peter still has dietary restrictions. He's still not willing to go to the Gentiles. We're 10 years into the gospel, and you're seeing how, how eventually God says, hey, if I don't, if I don't speed this up, these guys are never going to get to the Gentiles. Right? And so all of a sudden God comes on the scene, the Holy Spirit comes on the scene, he has this vision, all of a sudden Cornelius, uh, being holy and devout uh, before God, his, his, prayer, his prayers became like an alm before God, they were answered, right? And so once again, you see here that this is as much as it is for the Gentiles as it was for Peter, in the, in the grand scheme of things. David, Go ahead. also teaches us that we need to be patient with people. Need to be patient, yeah. It's yep. an entire... 180 degree change of life for these for the Jews. Yeah. And uh, for instance, when you came out of Catholicism, oh yeah, you weren't converted right away. No, no, no. So it, it teaches us that we need to be patient with yep. people who are changing their lives. Yeah, absolutely. Leaving denominationalism or not knowing anything about God or the church to be yeah. patient with them. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Look at verse 13 and 14 now. And he, talking about Cornelius, reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is called Peter, brought here. And he will speak words to you by which you will be, what does it say? Saved. By which you will be saved, you and all of your household. Wow. Verse 14 is crucial to your understanding. Why do I say verse 14 is, our, is crucial to our understanding of the proper context of that verse, or even this section of Scripture? Peter, uh, he's describing, right, what is going on to these Judaizers, converts to Christianity, right, who are upset that he violated uh, the oral traditions of the Jewish elders, right? And if you notice what it says in verse 14 there, he, go ahead, Tom. It's basically also saying that, that we're not talking about the conversion story or the the mercy is shown to a single Gentile. Yeah. It's to his household. It's to all Gentiles, basically. Yeah, to the household and to all Gentiles. Tyler? Uh, and it's not just somebody who hung out with Jesus saying, oh, yeah, this is for everybody as well. This is from the Holy Spirit that's come in and made this connection. So yep. it could, it's, it's, from, it's straight from upstairs. It's straight from upstairs, absolutely. One thing we have to notice here that you won't see in the original text is the word saved. If you go back and you were to look at chapter 10 again, it never said, the angel didn't say, hey, go send for Peter. He's going to give you a message in which you will be saved. But Peter knows what the gospel message is going to do for these people, right? So don't let that be lost on you in verse 14 there. Because that's a significant addition to Cornelius' report of what his vision was. That goes right in the face of the Judaizing teachers. It's yes. not the old law that's going to save you. Yeah. It's what Peter's going to bring to you that's going to save you. Yep. Which is the gospel. So Peter uh, tells them that I went there 
uh, to tell him the words whereby he and all of his household must be saved. Brother, think about this. Cornelius was not saved by the vision, was he? He had a vision, right? He wasn't saved by the angel, right? He wasn't saved by the miracle, right? The Holy Spirit came upon him. He still wasn't saved. What needed to take place in order for them to be saved, him and his household? Conversion. Baptism, conversion, Judy, Con right? But think about that. You have to hear the gospel message. You guys remember going back to our Sunday morning series that we've been doing? Right, right now we're looking at the church, but we've looked at the foundational pillars. We've looked at uh, the plan of salvation. What's the first thing you need in order to be able to be saved? You've got to hear. Romans 10 to 17. Remember, that was one of the memory verses, right? Faith comes from hearing, hearing from word the word of God. Well, who brought the word of God? Peter. Peter did, right? And then all of a sudden you have to then say, okay, you, yes, you have to hear, but you also have to believe, right? And we talked about Hebrews 11 and 6. And that without faith it is impossible to please him, for all who come to God must what? Believe that he is? And he's a rewarder of those that do. Reward those that seek him. So you have to believe. And so you see here, Peter comes, he had, uh, there's this vision, he, he, he obeys the Holy Spirit, he comes, he tells him, hey, why'd you call me? Uh, Cornelius tells him why, and he starts to preach to them. He starts to, uh, to give them the gospel, if you will. He starts to tell them what Christ had done for them. And then he lets them know, basically, also that they have to repent. And we know that repentance is important because God is saying that, therefore, he's overlooked the times of ignorance, that all people, he's declaring now that all men everywhere must repent. Why? Because he has fixed a day in which he's going to judge the world. Because he's provided proof by, uh, by, uh, by sending his son. Well, the son brought in repentance through the shedding of his blood. They didn't have it in the Old Testament. Yeah. Their sins carried forth from year to year. Yeah. They didn't have the forgiveness of sins. Absolutely. And why is repentance so very important? What did Jesus say about repentance? Mm -hmm. Luke 13, 3, what did Jesus say about repentance? If you don't repent, you will die in your sins. If you don't repent, you're going to die in your sins. So is repentance important? Oh, and it's also part of the plan of salvation. Do you think probably Peter probably spoke about that? Right? Many times. Do, you think, uh, do you think the Ethiopian eunuch heard that from uh, Philip? Absolutely. So you hear all this information. We know that they were to confess. And after they were to confess, they were to be baptized. Brethren, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 1 Peter 3 and 21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I mention all of this to just let you know, verse 14 is absolutely crucial. Because are there those in the world today, in Christian Christianity, Christian dumb, uh, that will teach that baptism isn't necessary for salvation? And the answer is yes. I'd like to hear everybody say yes, yeah. right? Think about that for a second. He wasn't saved by the miracle, right? They weren't saved by the angel. They weren't saved by the vision. They were only saved when they obeyed the gospel. Because obedience played a role in this. Because obedience played a role in it. And if you just, you know, I, I just wanted to point that out, because if you just make a note of that in your Bible, right? If you don't need to be saved, if, if, if baptism isn't, isn't required to be saved, then why did they be baptized after they already received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or not the gift of the Holy Spirit, I take that back. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like came upon them in Acts chapter 2. You see, brethren, if you continue on and we look at some of these verses, look at verse uh, here in verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. So remember, Peter's talking to the brethren now. And he says, and I remember the word of the Lord, how he used to say to us, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us, also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who am I that I should stand in the way of God? I love those two verses there. But notice what it says there. And notice, too, that the, being the, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't the baptism of Acts chapter 2. 
in the sense of being saved, right? They were baptized with the Holy Spirit in the upper room, but then they started to, to preach that day, and 3,000 of them uh, that wanted to come to Christ had to be baptized for the remission of their sins. These men received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they still needed to be baptized for the remission of their sins. Do you see that? It's important to see that so you can have this conversation with those in the world who still believe that baptism isn't necessary for salvation, but yet it shows it right here that it is, right? For those that want to think or believe or teach that God is female and the Spirit is yeah. female, he answers that question also in verse 15. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. So you look at this, you know, here Peter, he reaches the climax of his argument uh, with his brethren. He and the other Jewish Christians could not refuse those whom God had accepted. Because to refuse those who God accepts is to stand against God. Go back to the earlier chapters of Acts, right, when they were going to be punished. And uh, what was it, uh, Gamaliel, right, stood up for them. And he said, and remember, he gives the examples, guys, there's been many people who claim to be something. And people followed them, and then it basically became to be nothing, and then they died, and it kind of went away. He says, but if these guys are from God, if you resist them, you fight against God. Are you able to fight against God, right? And he basically tells them to be careful, right? Why don't you just kind of let this play itself out, and let's see where this goes, I mean, you remember in John, what was it, chapter, uh, John chapter 3 or John chapter 4, right? The Samaritan woman at the well. And you think about that conversation that Jesus had with that Samaritan woman, right? And you could kind of, you could kind of apply it to what you're seeing here in Acts chapter 11. Time will come when you will worship in a different place, worship yeah. in the Spirit. Absolutely. Then you get to verse 18 here in Acts chapter 11. Notice what it says. When they heard this, they quieted down. And they glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Notice what it says. He had granted to the Gentiles the repentance that also leads to life. You see, never anywhere in Peter's story does it talk about repentance. But we know if you study out the scriptures, is there a plan of salvation? And the answer is yes. Is repentance part of that plan? Yes. Yes. And you can see, even though it wasn't mentioned, what was mentioned right there? Repentance. You know what wasn't mentioned when uh, Philip was having the conversation with the eunuch? What wasn't mentioned? Baptism. Baptism was never mentioned. But hey, there's water. What hinders me? Well, nothing. If you believe with all your heart. But they must have been part of the conversation, right? I mean, isn't that the implication? When you look at the context of the, of the, of the verses? And so, go ahead. Yeah, Acts 22, 16. Here, let me read that one. <clears throat> yep. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. And what? Wash away your sins, calling on his name. Go ahead, Pat. I'm sorry. I was, I was waiting. Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> I seen his hand go up. Okay, never mind. Uh, and so, yeah, Gina, that, that goes hand in hand with this, right? Um Acts chapter 22, uh, verse 16, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 38, uh, 1, Tim or 1 Peter chapter 3, 20 and 21. There's lots of, uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, right? There's lots of passages of scripture that we could throw out there. Uh, Romans chapter 6, right? Uh, about 4 through 10, really, 4 through 8. I mean, there's lots of places you could turn to to see how, why and how all of this is important and that you could interconnect all of these things. And so these individuals now, they rejoice that God had granted repentance unto life to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. But Peter, now he sees this incident, uh, he sees in this incident the same principle for which Paul contended at a later date in Acts chapter 15. You see, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they were having uh, a pretty heated debate with some Judaizers. You guys remember what I said? Judaizer, right? Christian, Jew, still trying to basically marry them both together, you know, want to be a, a, a follower of Christ, want to be a, a, a disciple of Christ, but still trying to apply the law. And so Barnabas, right, in Acts chapter 15, and Paul, they have pride, a, kind of a heated debate, so much so that they send a whole delegation to Jerusalem. To have, a, to have a powwow with who? 
the elders, the apostles, right, the leaders. And so you know that story. And so you, you look at all of this here. It's made clear here that the Jews could not live as Jews and still be Christians. The Gentiles could no longer live as Gentiles and still be Christians, right? Do you have to convert and wholly give yourself over to God and all of his teachings in order to be a Christian, right? And so it goes back to that Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. Repent, or you will all likewise perish. That's why obedience, belief, trust, and obedience are important. That's why we talk about biblical faith. So I just wanted to slow down long enough to notice all these things. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 tells us there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What does uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, what does it really tell us? Go ahead. We don't, we don't lose our femininity or masculinity. What we do is become a child of God. And he a child accepts of God. all people. And he accepts all people who are willing to come unto him. So you know what that means? We're, on all, we're all on equal footing before God, right? Do we have different roles, right? different responsibilities, different gifts? Yes. But guess what? We're all on equal footing before God. And if we're all on equal footing before God, and even though we have different functions and roles and responsibilities, we are all one in Christ. We are all equal in Christ. And so we all stand before on equal footing before God. And as we move, before we move on to verse 19, we're going to see now a transition in the text, right? And we're going to start to see how the Luke, uh, the historian, how he picks up the thread of events that go back to Acts chapter 8. So we're kind of going to go in, in, in our minds, in our thought processes, a little bit backwards. Because he's going to kind of pick up where he left off in Acts chapter 8. And where all the tens of, all the thousands of the disciples that had been converted at Jerusalem have been scattered abroad. Except for the apostles. That's what the scriptures tell us, right? And all of this persecution happened and started around the time of the persecution uh, or the martyrdom of Stephen, right? And some of those men who were scattered, they went to faraway places. And that's the reason why I want to touch on this, because it's not like they went from Allen Park to Lincoln Park or from Allen Park to Dearborn, right? They went from Jerusalem to as far as uh, Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Well, why is that important? Well, Phoenicia is like 400 miles north. Right? 400 miles away. And all of a sudden, you're seeing how these people who were scattered all over, they weren't scattered a couple blocks over. It wasn't a couple towns or villages. They were literally 400 miles away. Think about 400 miles, not in our time, where I jump in the car and I'll be there in a few hours. No, 400 miles would take a, that would be a long, arduous journey to get to where they were going. And guess what? Because of the persecution, they didn't have time to call a U-Haul or two men in a truck, pack everything up, and head north. They left with just the little things that they were carrying, Jim. So, so that would be kind of like us taking the gospel to like the heathens in Columbus. Yeah, right, the heathens in Columbus, absolutely, right? I mean, many of us think of them as dogs, and, as, you know, and, but, you know, we're Christians now, so we have to remember that even the dogs are on equal, I mean, the Buckeyes are on equal footing. <laughs> Right? But no, we, we do what we have to do. Right, Jim? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I like that. So, again, you remember that even these that were scattered, though, they weren't going to Gentile areas. They were still preaching to Jews in those Gentile areas, right? You know, even though they were outside of the land of Palestine, they still weren't going to Jews. Or, I'm sorry, to Gentiles. They were going to Jews within those Gentile areas, right? They were speaking to Jews only, I think. Huh? They were speaking to Jews only. Yeah, to Jews only. And it, that's why Peter finally brings the gospel uh, to, the, to the Gentiles in, in the chapter that we're looking at, the last couple chapters here. So, so this, the persecution which followed the death of Stephen really was twofold in effect. It dispersed the disciples, preached, uh, and, the, and, and those dispersed disciples preached Christ and established churches uh, throughout Palestine. And the second thing is the churches were established uh, beyond Palestine. Phoenicia uh, was a district uh, which lay north of Palestine, off the shores of the Mediterranean, uh, by Lebanon. Uh, you were cities like Tyre, sound familiar in the Old Testament, right? T Tyre and Sidon, uh, Triopoli, uh, it for, it, which was part of the Roman, all part of the Roman uh, province of Syria. So again, I'm just giving you a little bit of this background because we're kind of going backwards as we finish out chapter 11 to where Luke, the historian, picked up from Acts chapter 8. 
if that makes any sense. And so now starting in verse 19 of Acts chapter 11, notice what it says. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, they made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except for Jews alone. But, were, but, were, uh, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number believed and turned to the Lord. Notice that it says that the hand of the Lord, right? The hand of the Lord is really just an Old Testament expression. And this was proof that the Lord was with them, that the Lord was working through them. Even though they're scattered, they continue to be blessed by the Lord. They continue to uh, have the right words to speak uh, in the moment that they need to speak them. Uh, the Holy Spirit is, uh, is being with them and is departing gifts upon individuals as needed in those different areas in order to bring about the will of God, in order to bring about converts, right, to Christianity. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 22, it says, the news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Bar uh, Barnabas off to Antioch. Think about that for a moment. Barnabas would have had to have traveled over 300 miles. So the church at Jerusalem says, hey, we're going to send you on a journey. 300 miles. I think they were lucky to get 10 miles a day. Yeah. If they, if they were traveling by mule. Yeah, I mean, think about that. You guys ever uh, on your treadmill put it up to about four miles an hour? And if you're like me, after like that, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, you're just huffing and puffing, right? And that's walking on a nice, smooth surface. They didn't have real good roads, roadways, and they didn't have, you know, a nice straight, you know, things were, you know, done east and you know, north and uh, south and east and west, right? It, these were difficult travels. You weren't traveling 15, 20 miles a day. Uh, I guess depending on the region, maybe you could come close to probably 15 miles a day, but I mean, in reality, you know, 10 miles, maybe 12, for, you know, 13, 14, if you're lucky. And in sandals. in sandals, right? In the blistering heat, right? That's right? So you look at this information, verse 23. Then when he arrived, Barnabas, when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. So ask yourself in verse 23, what does Barnabas mean by teaching the Gentiles to remain true to the Lord? Remember, he's 300 miles north, right? He's in pagan territory. He's in Antioch. And, and, and he, Barnabas reminds them, because remember, they don't have the book of Acts yet, right? Barnabas isn't taking the copy. You know, Luke is writing about what Barnabas did. So he doesn't, he's, not taking the, he's not taking the written letters yet. So he goes there and he, tell, he has to remind them to remain true to the Lord. Why do you think that he found it necessary to say that? What are, the, what are those people in Antioch inundated by? Paganism. Right? So do you think there was going to be some peer pressure? Right? Do you think there was going to be some temptation to maybe fall back into your old ways? And so anytime, and that's kind of like Paul and Barnabas and the others, as they establish churches on missionary journeys, what they do a year or so later? They fall back around and recircle the wagons, and they go back to what? To encourage and to see exactly what was going on, to make sure that they were doing, thus saith the Lord, right? Following their tradition, the oral traditions, until the letters were circulated. Jim? I, I was just going to say, we, we also have to keep in mind, too, that this area of this time frame, the people were very polytheistic, right? Yeah. So they hear about God, and they're going to follow Jesus and follow those procedures, but then they're going to start to think, well, yeah, but I can also add in these other gods yeah. and do both at the same time. Yeah. And they had to be reminded, this is an exclusionary thing. All that other yeah. stuff is fake, and this one's real. Yeah, and it's kind of what I said a, a few minutes ago. Jews can no longer be Jews if they wanted to be Christians, and Gentiles can really no longer be Gentiles. Think like Gentiles if they wanted to be Christians, right? You have to be converted. Isn't that why Acts chapter 12 talks about the, the transformation of the mind, right? And uh, the transformation of your life. And as you transform to a, into a disciple of Christ, it should show outwardly the things that are changing inwardly. Make sense? And so that's why they have to then remind these individuals because of everything that is going on. You get to verse 24 through 26, and notice what it says. For he, Barnabas, was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and, consider, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he uh, had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for about an entire year, they met with the church, and they taught considerable numbers 
And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. That's the first time you're seeing that term used in, verse, in that uh, chapter, or verse 26. Then in verse 27 and 28, it says, Now at this time, some of the prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there, uh, that there, would, that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And so we know that Luke is a historian. But when we think about Agabus, Agabus is mentioned only one other place, and that's in Acts chapter 1. We know that he was from Judea, and by a very a simple uh, object lesson, he foretold the imprisonment, of the imprisonment of Paul at Jerusalem. But we also know that his name actually, um, I'm trying to remember what his name signified. It means locust, right? So think about it. He's, he's uh, prophesying about uh, a famine to come, and his name literally means locust, right? And here at, Ag here at this time, Agabus, he's signified by the Spirit that this wouldn't be a local famine, but this is going to be a worldwide famine. And so the, Luke, the historian, points out that it was happening during the days of Claudius, which we know that Claudius reigned between 41 and 54. Well, we know that Acts chapter 10 is about 10 years after the church, so you're talking about between 43 and 44. And these little details are important for those historians that are much smarter than me, that go through the, the Bible and the history, and they try to put together an accurate timeline. Well, it's because of people like the historian Luke uh, that, that uh, provides so much great detail, uh, names, places, um, uh, emperors, right? People of position and power. So then you could go back and you could take some of the his other historical record and then combine it together and you could start to put together uh, an approximate timeline, right? Yeah. Not perfect, but approximate. Prove the Bible is accurate and true. Yeah, prove the Bible is accurate and true. And it does that every time. Acts chapter 11, verse 29, it says, And in the, and, and in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. In Judea. Well, think about this now. These were Gentile converts to Christianity who are going to take of their own means to pri uh, pr uh, provide benevolence for the people who used to call them dogs and outcasts and probably every other evil name under the sun. And these people are reaching into their pocketbook in order to provide support for their brethren in Jerusalem and Judea. And so, brethren, it, it, it shows uh, just how much these individuals would have had to have transformed in their minds and in their hearts in order to take of their own resources and give to a people who used to hate them, right? Don't you ever hear sometimes where people say, you know, it's hard for us to love like Christ it's hard to love others like Jesus loves. My wife works in a hospital, and she has to deal with some stressful people and patients, and she says it's hard to sometimes love people like Jesus loves, right? And then you think about these Gentiles who were literally uh, the butt of all the jokes. Uh, they were literally the recipients of all the hate and the prejudice, right, and the name-calling, and, and, and how many times probably Jews would have turned their backs on them in, the, in a time of need, and yet these were some of the first examples of of Christian charity that we see, uh, besides obviously Acts chapter two and three in the beginning of the church. Patrick, um, you get the last word, buddy. We're about to be out of time, so you get the last question. statement. Um, are the Jews a religion or a race? The Jews are a, a race, and Judaism is a religion. But when I say Jews, most of the times Jews and Judaism kind of go hand in hand when you're studying the Bible. Yeah, so. Huh? They occupied Judah. They, uh, yeah, occupied Judah. And so where does the, the name uh, Jew come from? From Judah. So that's where the name actually spawns from. So they are Jews. Jews is a race, right? Hebrew are, people. Uh, they're from the tribe of Judah. That's how the, where the word Jew comes from. But they're of the religion of Judaism. So there are today, so there are Jews that the, are Christians. Oh, there's, oh, yeah, there's Jews that are converts to Christianity, and there's... Uh, Jews that practice uh, Judaism and probably other probably other religions. You get reports of that yep. occasionally in uh, uh, periodicals that are uh, done by the, by the church, people of the church. Yep. Gospel Advocate and Christian Chronicle. You'll see the reports of Christians yeah. meeting in oh, yeah. Jerusalem or in other cities. Yeah, absolutely. Tyler? Uh, I think the term is Messianic Jew. I met a fellow, <laughs> and he says, I'm full-on Christian, but uh, my family's Jewish, so we go through all the procedure." 
And I thought, okay, well, I don't care too much. But then we got to talking about the Last Supper, and he could he could explain because in his because they go through this ritual yeah, yeah. of like uh, what the last like he could identify things that I would never have thought of just because of the order of when they're drinking of the cup and things. And yeah. Oh well, that's interesting. But the yeah. term I heard was. Yeah, I don't think I'd call him a Judaizer. If I remember, I'll call him the next time I see him. Well, you would, yeah, you would only be a Judaizer if he was a Christian, but you know, keeping uh, the keeping aspects of the old law. If he's just celebrating traditions, like you know, uh, you know, I know we don't ever have Christmas in the church, right? But what Christian doesn't celebrate Christian? I know there's some, you know, on the fringe, you know, on the far, far right. But most Christians celebrate Christmas, but not as a religious holiday, but as a uh, as a cultural holiday, right? Uh, and so there's that difference. And so I wonder if he probably still uh, celebrates certain uh, feast days seems for like cultural eating, reasons and like not religious pretty reasons. Good. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Even on Sundays. Huh? All right. Um, we're going to have a prayer. Randy, would you have a prayer, uh, closing prayer? And uh, if we can remember, uh, let's God, see. We God had, knows who they are. Yeah. I'm not gonna I know there's quite a few of the names. Yep. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this hour of study. We're thankful for David and his preparation in this lesson. Father, help help us to be more open-minded to the truth and take it into our hearts and minds and practice it and use it, Father, to reach those outside the church, those that are living in sin and dying in sin, Father, that need, need to hear the gospel and the truth of the gospel shared with them. Father, we ask that you be with all those of our congregation who are ill, who are hospitalized, who had surgery, and who will be having surgery, and those that are recuperating. Father, we're thankful for their doctors. We're thankful for their nurses, the knowledge and the experience that they have mm -hmm. to bring them through this difficult time and help them re come back to their health, restore their health, so they can be back with their families and be back to worship and fellowship with us as well. Father, thank you for all the blessings. Thank you for your mercy, Father, that you give us each and every day. Through your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ladies, don't Amen. forget to shower on Saturday at 11 o'clock.